Howdy everyone, Ole Liddell here. Welcome to part four of my video series on exposure blending. What I'm going to demonstrate today is how to create masks for blending multiple exposures by selecting and defining edges using a method I call luminosity edge selection masking. Whereas the name implies uses one or more luminosity selections to create a blending mask where you can brush in parts of the luminosity selection along with a cool little brushing trick that I'll show you to precisely select or otherwise define an edge that you want to serve as a major boundary for compositing two or more photos. It's a closely related but slightly different masking technique than what I've demonstrated up to this point using luminosity selections in previous videos and it's part of the process of creating your initial blending mask and usually eliminates the need to correct blending artifacts using adjustment layers or dodging layers because those artifacts simply aren't generated at all in the initial blend. So let's get started. Okay, so here we are back in Photoshop, and I've got three different exposures that were taken. This is a site that you might recognize from part two where I showed a photo that I took from the same location using a telephoto lens instead of the wide angle shown here. And in that video, I showed you how to apply a gradient mask as well as a simple brushed layer mask to blend two photos together. Um, what I'm going to do today is demonstrate a technique that um, I've developed. There may be others that use it as well, but it applies standard luminosity selections and techniques associated with that with um, some pretty minor brush technique and settings to hone in on particular edges that you want to use as a transition to blend two photos together. That's the technique I used to blend this particular shot, but I want to show this photo specifically as a comparison of automated HDR processing with manual blending techniques. So if you recall in part one I talked about how inferior automated HDR tone mapping applications are in terms of final image quality compared to manual blending. I uh, have to apologize to those who really like using HDR tone mapping, uh, but it's just simply true. If you haven't used manual blending and compared it with your HDR automated workflow, uh, then you're, you're missing out. Uh, you don't know what you're missing. If you have made those comparisons, you know what I'm talking about. So I'm quickly going to demonstrate the difference here. And uh, this is the final blend for this particular image. If I show you the layer mask, here's what the uh, luminosity edge selection looks like. I'm just going to disable that for now. So I have three images. I have the standard base exposed for the land. I have one that was exposed for the sky and one that was overexposed just for the shadows. Now for my camera, I only need two if and sometimes only one shot to obtain uh, complete dynamic range. And I rarely bracket, but I was intent upon using this example for this video series and have been asked by some of my students to um, elucidate manual blending related to and relative to automated HDR blending. Um, but this particular blend only involves these two photos. Um, a very good blend. It's essentially ready for final output. I did make a a uh, slight increase in luminosity in the blues in the sky as you can see right here. I didn't need to do that. I can go either way with it. But for final blending, about the only thing I'm going to have to do, or final output, is to remove these jet trails. Otherwise, this image is ready to go. Now this photo is an example showing HDR processing through photomatics. And as you can see, it's not nearly as high IQ as is this image in the manual blend. The, the photomatics image is flatter. It doesn't have the contrast. There's a slight blue cast to the image. It doesn't handle the sky as well or the highlights in the mountain on the glaciers. And if I zoom in, to show you more detail, 
you can see that particularly revealed along the ridge line, is that our detail has been softened. Our blacks have been blocked up. We have an overall flatter image. And if I toggle back to the manual blend, you can see that we have far more, far more tonal detail, far more um, resolution, and far more contrast and color saturation. And if I didn't want to, I purposely burned down this ridge line right in through here so that it contrasted better with the mountain. But I didn't need to do that. At any rate, point is, I have a much better blend using manual techniques than using automated ones. And that's going to be a notorious problem for any automated techniques in Photoshop or similar programs such as On One's Perfect Photo Suite. If it uses sliders and buttons, it's not going to give you the control and the selectivity that you need to get the most out of your images. So if you're doing HDR photography and any manual blending where you might be using automated techniques, that's why I wanted to do this video series. And uh, as a result of some of the questions I have been getting from some of my students. So let's go back to this shot that we saw back in part two. So again, if you recall, when we did that blend, using those particular simple masking techniques, we had these artifacts that were created right here on the ridge top and around the treetops here. We burned them. We don't see them here. This is the final blend using the luminosity edge selection technique to create this mask. You can see a very complicated mask, very precise mask. We did this all with luminosity selections. Indeed, they're our friends. If I delete this layer mask, you can see let's go ahead and I didn't delete that. Let's completely delete it. There we go. We have one image that was processed twice, so it was double processed in Lightroom. It works particularly well when you do that, um, when you applying this technique. This image was exposed for the foreground and the land, this for the sky. So to use this technique, what you want to do is find these high contrast areas, such as the ridge top and the trees, and then find yourself a luminosity selection that targets those areas. So I had decided that a shadow darks which is a darks 3, and a super darks, also known as a darks 4, would be the ones to target the ridge line and the trees. So what I'm trying to do here is actually mask in just the edges around the tree and the sky and the edges on what's known as Governor's Ridge and over here by Barrier Peak. And if I use a darks 3, you can see there's still a lot of the sky selected. Probably too much. I could still get a good result out of this. Very good. But it'll take just a little more time. So generally speaking, you want to use a little bit more restrictive luminosity selection than you would think otherwise. As long as you still have the edges and areas that you want to have affected selected. So in this case, Super Darks works well. So what I'm going to do, you want to go back to your layer, make sure you have a layer mask applied. In this particular case, I'm going to hide the layer mask. I'm going to go back up to my channels tab and I am going to select and load a super darks channel. Now that is a selection and I'm going to hide the selection so the marching ants aren't distracting. Go back to the layer, make sure the layer mask is selected. I want to reveal that edge so I want to paint with white. So my white brush is selected. Make sure your mode for the brush, not the layer, but the brush is set to normal. Choose an appropriate brush size, but instead of masking in everything, I'm going to concentrate just in the areas of the tree where the sky is showing through and tie in to the ridge line. And if you notice right over here on your layer mask, it's going to start showing white. 
And that tells you that you're painting in that selection that you want. So I'm going to make sure the edge of the tree and then just the ridge line here is selected. I don't want to slop all over the place, but I don't need to be ter terribly precise either. I just want to reveal that edge. And I'm going to go back to my layer mask, and you can see there it is. I can now work on the layer mask itself. Because I have a loaded selection and I'm painting through it, I can actually be more aggressive and get more paint on those selected pixels than if I were to go back to the actual layer mask. You can see that the mask I'm working on is actually the lighter in these areas. That's because I'm forcing the paint through there. I'm forcing a little bit more through there. So you can do that with active selections. If I just applied the full mask, I wouldn't have been able to get quite that much paint through on these edges. The reason why you want to use this technique rather than creating a full mask and then painting out what you don't want is that you can be more selective but you can get more paint where you want it and we need to select or we need to create a very hard well selected edge along this entire ridge top or in the case of some other photo where ever you're trying to create that selection that's going to serve as the basis for transitioning and blending two or potentially more than two images together. So you can see I'm just going to go over this ridge as much as I need to to get this edge as well selected and as light as I need to. And I can keep doing this multiple times to push a lot of paint through here. I just have to be careful that I'm not going to push too much paint into adjoining areas that I don't want to have selected so that I have, that way I don't have as much cleanup to do after the fact. But if you've selected a very good luminosity selection, you should have a good contrasting difference between those edges, the black and the white side of your edge. Or you won't have to worry about it. So now when I get my mask roughly to this condition, this is about as much paint as I can push through the selection. I want to deselect the selection. And then I'm going to zoom in a little bit so you can get a good look at what I'm about to do. And here's where I'm going to show you a trick to get a better selection. I'm actually going to take my brush now on the mask. I'm going to change the brush to overlay rather than normal. So previous to this, when I was masking in the mask, I was using the normal mode. Now I'm going to use the overlay blend mode. And so that's going to push white severely onto existing white pixels and want to push them to 100% white and vice versa for black. So you can see in the overlay mode, since I already had most of my white pixels close to 100% and they were far different or opposing the black pixels, that I can get that edge completely put in with white. Now I'm starting to go over and lighten up the darks, but before I get it too light, I just switch my brush to black and now I'll paint back in the opposite direction and you can see I don't have to worry about darkening that white edge because I've already gotten it 100% white. So in this way I'm going to use white and black alternating back and forth to make sure that I have my white fully masked in and once I have that done I'm going to work on my black and I don't have to be precise. If it looks like I still have some more work to do on the whites, then I can go ahead and work on them. But through several progressions of switching back and forth to your white, as long as you've done a good job of selecting an appropriate luminosity channel to begin with, then you can see how you can work on this entire edge 
and you can get a very good final masking result. That edge is what you want. Okay, so I can do this, continue to do this along the entire edge. At some point, I'm going to need to fill this entire foreground with white. So I'm going to start doing that now, and I'm going to draw in using my lasso tool. I don't have to be terribly precise yet. And now we're just going to go ahead and fill that selection with white. I can go back to my brush if I want, and I can start to clean that mask up. Of course, I need to make sure that I'm back in the normal blend mode. And I can go back to the overlay blend mode if I need to, but you get the idea. And so I'm going to go ahead and delete this layer mask and apply one that I already worked on. We'll reveal it. So here's what that final product would look like. Now, that did not take long for me to mask in. Believe it or not, that was less than five minutes of work to get that selection. It's very accurate and precise, and it gets me where I want. But I also want to tone up the darks in the mountain, because now through this mask you can see they're darker than is the ridge line. And that shouldn't be the case because that mountain is still five to six miles from Governor's Ridge. So there should be atmosphere there and I need to balance that out, make it more realistic. The other thing is you'll notice how the snow fields here in the foreground are blown out. And it's okay to have some of that, but I don't want that to be lighter than the highlights in the mountain because it's going to compete with it. So I need to tone that down. So well, the way to do that is, again, using our friends, luminosity selections, and I've determined that a super lights is what I need. So I'm going to go ahead and load that super lights, select my layer and my layer mask, and this time I'm going to make sure my brush is set to black. I'm going to hide the selection, and then before I go to the mask, I'm going to just go ahead and make sure that I brush over the areas where the snow fields are located, I'm going to make sure that I brush over a little bit here where the light sky showing through the needles and the branches on the fir and the spruce trees. Now I'm going to go back to the bright highlights on the snow fields. I don't want to do this on all my highlights everywhere, but I at least want to do it a little bit on snow fields here to recover those highlights. So I'm just going to brush over them real quick so that they're defined. If I go back to my layer mask, you can see here we, here we are. I'm going to continue in the normal blend mode with my brush to get that more fully masked in. Make sure that the blacks are as black as the luminosity selection will allow them to be. And then I'll switch my brush back to the overlay mode again and I'll do the same thing that we did with the edge along the sky. And just make sure that those are fully black. And then if I start to see the mid-tones in between there start to get too dark, I'll make sure that I hit those with the overlay blend mode and the white brush so that I'm not gonna reduce the contrast in those areas too much. So, Using that method, we end up masking in the, e the detailed edges associated with those snow fields. Likewise, I can now deselect that. I can go back to my shadow darks, hide that, and then I can go ahead and Let's make sure they're still selected. They aren't. Shadow darks. See what I did there before is I didn't have the layer mask selected. That's important. Otherwise, you're going to be removing pixels from your image. And so now I'm just going to go ahead and you can see as I do that, I'm now lightening 
those dark areas on the mountain a little bit. Important to make sure you're in the normal overlay mode or the normal blend mode. And now that's more realistic. You can see that it looks like we have atmosphere between the mountain. And when we go back to the layer mask, there we have it. Now that's just about final. I would have had to spend only a couple more minutes to get a final luminosity mask out of that. And I'm going to load one that I created earlier. And there it is. Let's take a look at it. There's what it looks like. And if we zoom in real closely, we can see again, we have very nice detailed edges. They're not overly harsh. They're not edged real hard. We don't have bright edge artifacts or halos in the sky next to the tree or along the ridge top. We don't have burned edges anywhere along the ridge top. If we wanted that, we could of course tone it down a little bit and mask it back in. But we now have a final baseline image that is ready for the final creative post-processing steps. So I hope you've learned something today and will be able to apply that in your own workflow. If you have any questions on this video or any of my previous ones, don't hesitate to contact me via my website at imagesbybolin.com and click on the contact link and I'll answer any questions you might have. Otherwise, uh, keep your eyes peeled for future videos. There'll be at least a couple more in this series. Uh, and the next one is going to introduce some of the automated selection techniques that are available within Photoshop. That, And we're going to demonstrate it on this uh, very same image that will provide us a nearly identical blend and will provide us an identical blend when we marry those selection techniques with our friends' luminosity selections uh, to refine them a little bit more. So with that, I uh, hope you learned something and enjoyed watching, and uh, happy shooting, everyone.